All right, so I'm here with uh, legendary WCW announcer Gary Michael Capetta at the Monster Factory in Paulsboro, New Jersey, is it? Yes, it is. So, um, how, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. It was great to be here. I gave a few seminars on the physics of pro wrestling, and um, I always like doing it. It's just to, to support the stars of tomorrow, the guys that are training now, Okay. because they're the future of the business. Yeah, and um, for fans, for the uh, fans that are that were around in the late '80s or in the '90s, you were the voice. To me, you were the voice of WCW, the ring announcer, yes. with a very, very iconic voice. Now, how did you get there? Like, as far as uh, being a ring announcer in this business? Well, uh, well, in the very beginning, I just volunteered. There was not anything to it. Mm-hmm. And then I worked for. Well, before it was WWE, it was WWF. Okay. I worked with them, the McMahon family, for 11 years. Then, when I finished there, I started working a little bit with AWA, and it was the first pro wrestling show on ESPN. Oh, so this was the post, uh, the post Hulk years when Hulk This was the mid 80s. Oh, okay. So, um, how was how was that with Vern Gagne and being in Minnesota? It was okay. I actually did the the shows in Atlantic City. Oh, oh yeah. It was uh, the Tropicana, but he flew me out a couple times to do pay per views for him. Uh, one was in Chicago, and one was in Minneapolis. You're right. And then from there, I started working with the Crockets in NWA. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, that was one of my favorite years. Uh, like in the 80s, like after the first Starcade had premiered, because I was a wrestling guy and I and I grew up in um, Honolulu, Hawaii. Wow. So like we had watched NWA mostly. Uh, WWF not so much. Um, not until like when when they started doing pay per views with WrestleMania, and that's when they started taking over. Yeah. But I was also I was always a fan of NWA because they had wrestling. There's not too much of a, a showmanship type thing. Yes. It, when I when I left the uh, WWF, it was what I always say is it was comparing the ballet of WWF to the kick butt wrestling of NWA, <laughs> and I had never seen anything like that. So okay, you know, so hard and um, yeah, I mean you just get captured into Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA and Flair mm-hmm. and Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express. And, Nikita Koloff, it just went on and on and on. Now, I know you have stories about, like, you know, being on the road and, you know, traveling with some of the talent or, you know, some some ribs that, that they played on you or you've seen have been played on, the, on other wrestlers. Well, when I was when I was really young and I started with um, WWF, um, I was totally unaware of really the inner workings of the business. Like, that was not a time when they shared anything. Okay. I, mean, I, I wasn't even allowed to dress with the wrestlers. Whoa. That's how separate they kept us. Yeah, because they didn't want me to see, like, a heel and a face playing cards or whatever. Okay. Or even being in the same room. I know it's hard to today to, like, think about it or to wrap your mind around it, but that's how serious things were. It's hard to imagine because, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to expose the business, but this is a... Uh, show entertainment type uh, I don't want to say sports entertainment but entertainment type uh, show where you know you have your actors you have your players you're the ring announcer and the commentator yeah but that's not how it was portrayed then. okay it was portrayed as a legitimate competition okay so um, yeah and they and they protected that so um, they used to the guys liked me because I was energetic mm-hmm. and because I believe really I was a fan mm-hmm. and so in the early days people like Jimmy Snooker and George Steele and Peter Maivia they would like use me as a prop you know they, they'd really? body slam me they would they would chase me they, and it I was you know scared to death because I really believed what was going on what was the scariest thing that you encountered? Uh, when George Steele jumped me from behind on national, on national television. He just literally jumped, pounced on top of you from behind? Yes, he did. And, um, yeah, so they used me as a prop. <laughs> and even though I was uh, afraid, mm-hmm. it drew attention to me. It was an attention that I asked for. Okay. But they just let me into the store board. They just used me as a toy. Oh man, that is terrible. That, no one ever heard me. Okay, okay. Well, you you were way before the times where 
you know, they're attacking ring announcers now because I remember a couple weeks ago, Bobby Cruz or Ring of Honor was attacked uh, by, um, I think, a Tetsuya Naito from New Japan Pro Wrestling. So you, you were way before that, way ahead of the curve. Yeah, that was... So, but WCW, nobody touched you. Um, WCW, no, nobody touched me. I, because by then, I think I had established myself, okay. and they looked at me a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a, more of a veteran then, mm-hmm. as opposed to this wide-eyed kid who you know, didn't know yeah. what he was doing, who, who was, you know, what was going on. Yeah, so I had a, a, a level of credibility that I obviously didn't have when I started. So how was it trans- transitioning from uh, world, uh, from doing the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, WWE, going to NWA and then going to WCW? Well, WCW is a whole different ball game for me because I went full time. Okay. Uh, I had taught school um, until I went to WCW, and I was able to work for all the other organizations while I was teaching. Okay. But in 1989, when Ted Turner bought the wrestling promotion for the Crockets. Mm-hmm. I actually went on the road full time and I traveled for the day. So that was the that was the huge difference. And also in WCW they still keep they still kept you out in the locker room because of the whole thing. Oh no 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 no. No even back in the WWF that that changed. It was only for the first two years, year okay. and a half. Uh, like I said, they they didn't uh, they didn't dress you up in a broom. You didn't dress up in a broom closet, did you? Yeah, more like that. Like, <laughs> it depended on the building. Okay. You know, like it could have been the, like where the EMT had their stretcher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like that. I think it was about two years that they kept me in the dark. Okay. And then they couldn't anymore because then they put me on TV, and the dressing rooms of the TV was just one big common area. Okay. So there weren't separate rooms. There was no place to put me. Yeah. And I had to go around and you know find out where everyone was from and what they weighed. And, because they would constantly bring new guys in for TV. Okay. So that would have been two years in. No, so by the time I got to WCW, I had been in the locker room, you know, for, for a long time. Okay. Well, now um, you you had a little small session earlier about uh, brand promoting your brand and right. you know the, the the ins and outs. And one of the things I and I'm gonna put this on blast myself, and I hardly do this, was people on smartphones around the ringside area. Oh. Uh, that's a pet peeve of mine. Um, I go on rants sometimes. I'll tell you the truth, I'm a little tired right now, so I'm not going to go on a rant. But if I were to go on a rant, this would be one of the things. Because I do guest ring announcing in indie shows okay. from time to time. I'll be going out for NWA Mid-South in Memphis, mm-hmm. in Dyersburg, Tennessee in, in November and December. Not that this happens there, but I just as an example. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the ring announcer will be really fine, really good, good voice, good delivery. And he thinks that when he gets out of the ring, that his job is over. Mm-hmm. And it is not over as long as you are still being seen by the ringside people. So I have seen too many ring announcers make the introduction. The match starts, they're sitting at ringside, they take out their smartphone, and they start doing whatever they're doing on their smartphone. It's their job to support the wrestlers that are in the ring. It is their job to watch what's going on. It's the, because what message is it sending to the fans if someone that's with the promotion doesn't care about what's going on in the ring? I, I agree, and um, I made the point, you know, I asked you earlier about uh, Facebook Live because a lot of a lot of companies now are using Facebook Live in order to have some kind of third-party uh, camera work, you know, as opposed to the production that the, the company puts out. Which which is okay, but what you described to me, you said that the ring announcer is actually recording yes. in the middle of the ring, and that's wrong. Yeah, they, I know I know some that will do like a uh, birth, like a uh, point of view type thing. Like if there's a street fight and they're and two competitors are killing each other with their objects, they would just point the phone and just shoot it as far as live or they'll put it on Instagram. This is what happened last night. You mean sitting at ringside? Yes, sitting at ringside, right there in the action. Yeah, if it's like 30 seconds or something, I guess it's it's okay. It's that now you're. It was a little. I envisioned it a little differently when you told me about it. Okay. So now you're talking about it's like another camera that's capturing the action. Okay. That's okay. Well, okay. Well, <laughs> a half and half with that one. But you know, you were talking about teaching, and also you were telling uh, some of these uh, trainees here at the Monster Factory about having backup plans, backup plans as well as uh, making a brand. Yes. Um, what we were talking about 
because my topic at the training camps is the business of pro wrestling. Okay. So part of that is to be sure that you um, protect yourself, even if you have a successful career and you wrestle for decades. When you're finished, you're going to be 45 years old. Mm-hmm. Well, you still have another 30 years of life. Yeah. So you still have to be able to support yourself. Okay. And my point was that you should create something now while you're 20, while you're 19. You should either get a degree, get trained to do something, a skill, it could be carpentry, it could be anything that you can at any time go to in order to create a livelihood. And as a matter of fact, you could get hurt and stop wrestling at any time. Now, by the time that happens or by the time you retire, you may have a family to support, and you're not going to be able to go back to school. Mm-hmm. So you need to lay the groundwork now. Yeah, because I've seen a lot of injuries where, like, I, I'm just past 30, and, you know, some of the um, injuries I've seen are guys who are 25 years old who somebody says they have a look, they have a work ethic, they're going to go to the, uh, to the big league. And, um, that's, that's basically what I see. They get injured, and they, and they freak out, like, what am I going to do? Right. How I'm going to live. You, know? you shouldn't start thinking about it then. Because you know that it's going to happen. Not that you're going to get injured, yeah. but you know that your career is going to end while you, at a point when you still have to earn money. Mm-hmm. You still need to earn a living. Mm-hmm. So it would be insane to me not to prepare for that. Yeah. So, I mean, because a lot of times, you know, you see these older wrestlers, and some of them have been to, quote unquote, the big dance. And they made all this money. Yep. And they pissed away the money. That's true. And they're in their uh, 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe even beyond. Yes. Looking for another check. That's and right. It, and it's a tragic thing. I mean, we've seen that in that movie called The Wrestler, where we see the VFW halls and these guys are in wheelchairs and crutches. Yep. And they're still trying to sell wares from in their heyday or something that websites put out. Yep. And um, that's that's something that um, should be addressed to me. We just had a guy who was 18 years old, just graduated high school. And he's about to go on to college. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that, but a lot of guys say, like, well, that's my movement all the right. way. You know, I mean, I, I personally, I think, just work the weekends and you'll be fine. Yeah, well, it just depends. Everybody everybody begins in a, in a different way and grows in a different way. All I'm saying is when you are still halfway through life and you still have another half of life to live, you're going to have to support yourself. And at, at the time when that happens, if you're fortunate enough to be in the wrestling industry for 30 or 40 years, if you're fortunate enough to be able to do that and make a living, there's no pension. There's, there's no, you know, unless you start something on your own, you're not going to have money to live for the rest of your life. So that's what I was recommending. Like, prepare for that now while you can. Well, you were in WCW for about, um, you were there for a number of years. Right? Um, I, I forget how many years, though. I know there was a, a transition from you to Kenta. I was there for six years. Six years, and you just you just stopped. Right. At a certain point, you got, just got tired. Or no, no. They wanted me to move to Atlanta, and um, I was living in New Jersey, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to work in the office, and they wanted me to work in the office in addition to go on the road. Oh. They wanted me to do the TVs and work in the office. I didn't want to do that. That sounds very repetitive. I know. I just didn't want to be in that environment. Okay. Well, um, I tell you one thing. It's, it's been great uh, seeing you know sit down here talking to you. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to ask you, which I do at the end all the time, is do you have any advice for young wrestlers that we haven't seen that that they're up and coming wrestlers at any time? The, the best way to to get good at whatever it is, whether it be playing guitar, whether it be wrestling, whether it anything, is just to get out and do it, get the experience. Mm-hmm. So that would be my number one recommendation is to is to learn from a reputable school like the Monster Factory and get out there and do it. What's that? That's a shameless plug. <laughs> I'm not affiliated with the Monster Factory. I, I do no, no, no. appreciate what they do. Yes. I like the philosophy of you know that wrestling is a career, not a hobby. Yes. 
And um, also, do you have anything to promote, like your fans to? Uh, uh, like I said, I'll be in Tennessee in November and December. That's it. And so, then I'll put the brakes on because starting in February, I have my stage show right that starts touring. Really? And I no, start in Philadelphia not. on February in you were walking in the rain. 12th. You were ready to okay. go. And then we'll be uh, going over. Right now, I've got Boston lined up, Baltimore, and Philly, you start. a couple of towns in Ohio, and I've been talking to other other promoters. Okay, well, what I what I do is I'll look into the Baltimore date, okay. if not that, the Philly date, and I'll work it out to, to the point where I want to attend. I want to hear oh, some of the stories. Oh, that would be great. That would I, be great. I, I'm, this is my big thing in wrestling. It's the stories, you know, the, um, the, the, the uh, antidotes of ribs. That that's what I love now because right. I'm in I'm sort of in the business. I don't want to say that so I get heat, but I'm sort of in the business where you know I can see things on the inside as well as outside. So yes, I would love to come to a game. Cool. And I appreciate hope, that. And, and hopefully I can ring it out for you. Oh. You, you or can, stage it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. And if there's any promoters out there that wants to bring the show to their to their town, they just need to get in touch with me on Facebook at. Um, GMC for real, number four. GMC for real on Facebook. Oh, <laughs> with a little with a little slang in there. I'm GMC for real. There you go. Okay. Anything else like uh, email or? No, no. They, they can message me from there. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Much better. I appreciate it. Man, that's a mouthful to say. Yeah. You know, what really works for you is you're from Baltimore. Baltimore is one of my favorite cities. Yeah, I live in Baltimore. It's one of my favorite wrestling cities. You have a story? Uh, real quick? Uh, no. About any the things you love in Baltimore? Well, you know, restaurants for sure. <laughs> crab cakes for absolutely sure. You know, how could you lose with that? Well, I'll tell you what. You come down to Baltimore, I bring you to Jimmy Seafood, the oh, best crab cakes in town. Nice. Um, uh, by Johnny Crab Cakes. We'll sit down, have crab cakes, we'll shoot more stories. So. Love it. I'm, I'm there. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.